All right, well, that was an awesome time of worship. We're glad you guys are here with us today. And uh, as I spoke about just a little bit uh, before the baptism, God's really been moving in our midst uh, this summer. And and um, we've seen a lot of folks saved and uh, baptized uh, quite a few. We've baptized more weeks than we've not baptized. And uh, so we need to be praying for those folks and uh, get them involved. And we're seeing a lot of them involved in worship and ministry and we're so thankful the Spirit of God is moving here, and, um, you know, He'll move as He wills, but uh, a lot of that sometimes happens through our obedience, and it's just through the simple preaching of the gospel and loving people, and and uh, so let's pray that that continues, and, you know, today is an emphasis day, and we've been preaching through the book of Judges uh, with uh, uh, in a series we've called Unlikely saviors and but today uh, early last week I thought you know it'd be a good time to take a break from judges since it's friends and family day and we're likely to have a few visitors and thought I'd bring some kind of pertinent word for you today something encouraging and uplifting <laughs> I don't know where these hairs come from that get in my mouth obviously but um, but anyway but I, I wanted to give you guys something encouraging and uplifting and and, and, and for some reason, when I talked to the Lord about, Lord, what, what can I preach? What passage are you going to put on my heart? And, and uh, there was one passage that just kept springing forth in my mind. And it's Luke chapter 14, uh, verses 26 through 27. And uh, it says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children... Brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. <laughs> and I kept thinking, Lord, you won't, is that up there for you guys? Are we having, okay, good. I'm, my confidence monitor is not giving me confidence. So, but, but as I kept thinking about that verse, I thought, Lord, that's what you want me to preach today. Uh, and, uh, you know, I just couldn't get it out of my mind. And I just felt like um, that's what the Lord wanted me to share with you guys. You know, it's not really an encouraging, uplifting family and friends passage. And it's not really what I was looking for, but it's sort of where I wound up. But what I want to do today is go to a similar passage of Scripture in Matthew um, in chapter 10. And I want to read verses 34 through 9, 39 for a message that I've called Following Jesus. And what that means. And so follow along with me as we read these um, six verses or so. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. This is the word of God. Let's pray together for a moment. Father, we do bow before you this morning, and we're so grateful for who you are and all that you've done in our hearts and lives. And God, for the work that we see you doing in, in folks who are coming to us and becoming a part of us. And God, we pray that today that we would hear your truth about following you. And God, that um, in that, all of us, Father, would do whatever it takes to love you and follow you faithfully as long as you let us live in this world and spend eternity with you forever. God, call people to salvation today. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's really exciting to see people confess their faith in Christ and share their testimonies. Um, it's always interesting to me how people come to the place where they realize they're a sinner and that Jesus is 
God in the flesh and they come to that realization where they're doomed because of their sin and hopeless, the, the hopelessness that they find themselves in. And, and when they surrender to Christ as Lord, I, uh, I, I've never been more, more elated maybe with, a, and I hate to just point out one, but when Rachel uh, came to church and I, she contacted us or she came, she showed up to church one morning one Sunday morning, unexpectedly, really, and she came up to me and she just started talking to me. And, and she's like, oh, I'm sorry, I feel like I know you because I've been watching you guys online and watching you on YouTube. And, and uh, so I thought, well, yeah, I guess it would make you kind of feel like you know me as much as she said she'd been watching. But, but God just spoke to her through that. And I'm thankful for our online ministry and all those people that make those things possible. And you never know how that social media presence and that online presence might uh, uh, impact someone with the gospel. And so uh, I think we should utilize every means we can to reach as many people as we can. And so, Rachel, I, I was just elated to hear how God worked through you and to see how God is working in your life. And I'm interested in all of your stories. Every story is special. And, you know, if that's not something that you've experienced yourself, then this morning you have an opportunity for that. You don't have to be in a Sunday morning service to be saved, but it is a good place for it to happen, isn't it? Uh, because, uh, you know, in our church, we always uh, share the gospel and uh, give people that opportunity. And, and, and I want to ask you this morning that question, will you follow Jesus? And maybe you need to ask the question, am I really following Jesus? Because a lot of you say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian and I, and I'm one of his, but are you really following Jesus? That's a good question, isn't it? And that's what I want to talk to you about. And I think it comes from our text and just following Jesus. And when you choose uh, to give up your own rights and wishes for your life and start following Jesus, you inherit a lot of good things. I mean, becoming a child of God, I mean, and that's one of them. You, you become a child of God. And, you know, Jesus, Jesus said to all those that believe in him, he gives them the right to become the children of God. <laughs> oh, man. That's, that's who we want to be, isn't it? That's who we need to be. And, 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 and since you're a child of God, you have this eternal inheritance that I, I like to describe as out of this world, Right? It's an eternal inheritance, and, and it's everything that, that uh, belongs to Jesus, in essence, and it, la it lasts forever. It's a life that lasts forever in all that God offers, and uh, it's unfathomable for us, uh, the goodness of it. And, and you become a part of an awesome family because we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, right? Uh, you know, our, our spiritual family is an eternal family, whereas some of our uh, earthly family, our biological or, or um, uh, our families on earth, or whoever we belong to uh, in our earthly families may not be eternal because they all may not belong to Jesus. And there's, there will be a day of separation. And so you are gifted as a child of God and and you're empowered to do God's work, and you're given a peace that surpasses understanding. And, and so no matter what situation you find yourselves in, no matter how difficult it is, you, if you know you're a child of God, you can get through that. Amen? God has, has given you the ability to be at peace in those most difficult times. And, and those are just a few of, of, of the great things that happen when you become a follower of Jesus but but you another thing that happens though is that when you give your life to Jesus and you become a child of God you are immediately thrust into a spiritual battle with Satan and his powers that will continue as long as you live in the flesh in this world and you know what the enemy wants to do he wants to kill you and destroy you and if you give him a foothold that's exactly where you'll be and um, that's why Jesus says what he does in verse 34 in our text today he says 
Do not think that I come to bring peace on earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. <laughs> That's not what we expect to hear from Jesus, is it? I mean, he's the prince of peace. And, and we think, oh, he's bringing a sword. Now, this doesn't mean that, you know, and, and the, the crusades, the, the, the Christian crusades in those dark ages, you know, they had it wrong. Because they used the sword to try to force conversions. And, and, and they didn't approach it right. And, and we don't use swords today either to force the gospel into communities and, and into people and, and to uh, take the lives of those who oppose us. But Jesus is the Prince of Peace in the sense that he gives peace to all those who, who are his, like I described. But, but if you're not a follower of Jesus day, today, then you, you are his enemy. But when you come to him in faith, you become a part of the family. And in this family, at least, within the family, there should be peace. There can be peace. A lot of, there's not enough peace a lot of times. But I love the unity of our church here at the Fellowship Church. We've been doing this for 11 years since we really started. And people started gathering. And we're celebrating our 10-year official um, uh, beginning. And... Uh, you know, I've been in churches my whole life, and I've never experienced the kind of unity that we have here. Now, there's been times when, you know, Satan's tried to ruffle a few feathers, and some folks get upset and, and things like that, but not nearly like I've seen in so many other places I've been. I just thank God for that. But I mean, when you become a part of the faith family, you, you, you find this peace. But when you become a part of of the family of God, you will find out that you have some enemies. You have some enemies. And uh, how many of you know that you have a spiritual enemy today? I mean, Satan will talk you out of going to church. He'll talk you out of serving. He'll talk you out of giving. He'll talk you out of loving somebody or helping somebody or sharing the gospel. He wants to bring you down. And he's trying to destroy the name of Christ. And too often, we let him get a little bit of an edge, don't we? So if you have an enemy, and we do, you better be packing. <laughs> right? That's what Jesus basically said. That's why he said he brought a sword. And, and, and you know, the decision to follow Jesus, it's not really about that that physical sword or, or weapons of that nature but it's it's about uh, the spiritual battle and it's a spiritual battle that that we're all going to fight and the the more faithful you are to Jesus a lot of times the more you experience it but the more you experience it the 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 stronger you get amen and so what I really want to share with you today is is like, like we've already seen the decision to follow Jesus puts you in a spiritual battle you are in a spiritual battle. And so following Jesus, it's, it's a spiritual battle. And I want to share three important consequences with you today of following Jesus. Sorry, I left off Jesus on that. I don't know. I guess I got in a hurry. So, But y'all know who I'm talking about, right? <laughs> so um, the first one is this. When you become a follower of Jesus, I want you to understand it brings division. It brings division. And here in our passage in, in um, verses 35 and 36, there's this prophetic quote from the prophetic book of Micah. And it's a strange quote, really. It, but Micah is, is speaking about a time when the people of God have fallen away from the Lord. It's a, it's a time of apostasy. And, and people have left the Lord and they're probably serving idols and and, and he, he's addressing the, the care that the faithful must take at that time. And we've been looking at that in the judges, haven't we? Where so many people uh, you know, over, over the years, when they've got it good, they fall away from the faith and, and, and it draws and it changes who you are. The culture shapes you instead of letting God shape you and His Word shape you. And uh, that, that's kind of what was going on. You can't trust in the things of the world uh, you can't trust in those things. And here Jesus zeroes in on the part of that passage that says even families 
or to fight it in such a time like that. Now, this, this isn't the, the kind of passage you'd expect the Messiah to be bringing up. You know, you'd, you'd expect passages like we read, like, uh, you know, we've seen in the past about, you know, Jesus must, uh, establishing the Messiah's kingdom. But, but you don't expect a passage like this. And when we think of Christ and his church, the idea of unity is usually the thought that comes to mind. But following Christ brings division. That's why, that's why Jesus said he brought a sword because there's division and, and there's that enemy. You, you, can, you can expect to get hit by uh, the best uh, the evil of this world has to offer. When you follow Jesus, you can expect that. Christians are targets of many atheists and, uh, and, and, the, and the atheist groups. And um, you can see it. I mean, if you're involved in social media at all, you, you see it all the time, uh, especially, uh, you know, comments. And I used to get involved in some of those arguments, but, you know, the, the, there's a proverb that says, you know, um, that warns us about um, getting into arguments, senseless arguments with fools, you know. So, but, um, and that's what the Bible calls atheists, isn't it? But have you ever noticed, when's the last time you heard an atheist or even heard of an atheist taking a jab at a Buddhist. You ever hear him, hear him really jabbing a Buddhist? I, I don't know of any. I'm sure some of them do some, but, but or a Taoist or, 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 or even a Muslim. I mean, they just don't seem like they bother them. You know who they target? They target Christians, don't they? It's Christ that they hate. And, and the reason they hate Christ and hate Christians so much is because our God is real. And they are partnering with the enemy of God. And, um, you know, and, and so they, and, and the enemy of God knows that Jesus has already defeated Satan, right? It's all over but to celebrate almost, you see. But the only, only thing now is the love of God is being poured out through his church because he's not willing that, any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's giving people an opportunity to believe in him and trust in him. And so Satan knows that. He knows his day's come. And so he mobilizes his troops to attack Christ's followers. And, and the hardest truth of following Jesus is, is sometimes is this. It's that it doesn't just set us against a lot of friends who may not believe like we do. But it, a lot of times it sets us against our own biological or earthly families who don't believe like we do. And some of you probably have experienced that. I was blessed to have grown up in a family who at least professes to believe in Jesus, most everyone. And so uh, I never had a family member that really targeted me. But, but, but the, that's the hardest truth. And that's why Jesus said what he did in verses 35 and 36, setting a man against his father, a, a, a a, a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And then he emphasized a man's enemies will be those of his own household. You see, when, when, this is what happens. When a person believes in Christ and the Holy Spirit of God indwells them, there is now an innate desire for you to bring your family and friends to a faith in Jesus like you have. You want that. And so, and not only that, but your life has changed. And they see it. And that's convicting for a lot of them. And, and, and sometimes family traditions are forsaken. You know, especially if you come from another faith background. And, you know, maybe you don't practice things like the family used to. And, and so, uh, you know... Because those things might deny Christ or they disobey Christ. And so that means, you know, you're forsaking all other gods when you follow Jesus. And they're worshiping something else. And, and sometimes that means abandoning a family faith. And unfortunately, that means division in the family. And um, I, I read this week about Afshin Ziafat. Now, if I pronounce that wrong, I am terribly sorry, but my Farsi is not very good, so okay. But anyway, he, he was born in Houston, 
and he, he was born into a devout Muslim home. And Afshin, his, his dad was uh, very involved in the Muslim community, the Iranian Muslim community in, in Houston. And, and so as he grew up, he was taught the five pillars of Islam. And, and um, you know, he was told that if he did them to the best of his ability, then maybe he'd go to heaven. And that's basically what they teach. And so he, he wasn't raised speaking English, so he, or he wasn't born into an English-speaking family. He spoke Farsi, so at a very young age, he was sent to an English tutor. And so this, Christian, this woman that tutored him was a Christian. And so in second grade, she gave him a New Testament. And he basically snuck it into, snuck, I don't know if that's actually a word, but that's the way we say it in East Tennessee, all right? But, uh, so just get over it. But, but uh, he, he took that New Testament and he would go into his bedroom and get under the covers on his bed and with a flashlight he would read that New Testament so his parents wouldn't find out. And he grew up reading that Bible almost every day. And when he was in high school, he met a Christian student who sat across him at lunch and that student told him about Jesus and they would have discussions about Jesus and debates and things like that and and then um, uh, Af Afshin would go home and read his Bible to try to see if he could figure out what this guy was saying and, and one day when he was reading his Bible he got to Romans chapter 3 and his life was changed completely he said I read about a righteousness that comes apart from what I do for God. He said this righteousness comes as a gift to be received by faith. <laughs> and he said, I was struck by Romans 3.22, which, which says that this righteousness comes to all who believe. And he said, you know, I thought I was born a Muslim and I would always be a Muslim. But that verse said that this righteousness was for anyone who believes. Anyone of any ethnicity, of any religious background. And he said a couple weeks later, he said, a guy invited me to an evangelistic crusade. And he said, there I heard the gospel preached for the first time. And he said, and I came to faith in Christ. And he said, I hid this newfound faith from my family for a while. And he said, I would sneak out and go to church. And he said, I, I would intercept mail coming from the church before my parents could see it. But one day his dad found his Bible. Finally found his Bible and other evidence in his life. And he sat him down and he said, son, what's going on? He said, there's something different about you. And off she said, I said, dad, I'm a Christian. And his dad said, if you're going to be a Christian off Sheen, then you can no longer be my son. And off Sheen said, you know what? Everything in my flesh wanted me to say, you know what? Forget it. I'll be a Muslim. But he said, I didn't want to lose the relationship with my dad. So he said, I, I, I was surprised when I said to my dad, Dad, I have to choose between you and Jesus then I choose Jesus. And he says, if I have to choose between my earthly father and my heavenly father, he said, then I choose my heavenly father. And he said, my father disowned me on the spot. Afshin would then go on later to become a pastor. And by God's grace, he now has a relationship with his father, but yet his father has not yet come to faith in Christ. But this story raises a good question that we've seen, and really question for us today. If following Christ means losing the peace of your home and your family, or even losing your home or family itself, would you still follow Jesus? That's the question, isn't it? Would you follow him even if it costs you everything and everyone? That's what he asked of us, isn't it? And this is what Jesus is getting at here. He says, I brought a sword. I, I, I'm bringing division. Notice the words of Jesus in John 16, verse 33. He says, these things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. 
I have overcome the world. So he says, hey, you've got peace in me. He says, I've overcome the world. You're going to have tribulation, but I, I'll, you'll have peace in me. That's what he's getting at. And, and when you become a follower of Jesus, it'll bring division. It'll, it'll divide you with those who don't know Jesus. You'll be at odds with them. The question is, are you willing to suffer that for the cause of Christ? That's the question this morning. Another consequence of following Jesus is not only does it bring division, but it demands decision. Demands decision. Verse 30, 30 man, verse 37 uh, sort of continues the idea of being at odds against the family like we've seen in these first couple of verses. And he says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And so what Jesus, Jesus right here is emphasizing the importance of the right order of affections. Right? Get your priorities straight. How often should Jesus come first? <laughs> Five days a week? Six good enough? No. No. A lot of people just go think one Sunday, you know, and I'll go to church. The rest of the week they forget about it. No. Seven days a week. How many hours in the day does he deserve priority? All of them, right? I mean, <laughs> but here he's saying, look, if you love your mother and father more than me, or if you love your children more than me, you're not worthy of me. Ooh. Now, he's not telling us to scrap the fifth commandment. You know, one of the most important commandments is to love, honor our mothers and fathers. He's not telling us to do that. It's not about the Luke passage that I read to you earlier that says if you don't hate your mother and your father and the rest of your family, then, you know, uh, you, you're not his. Then, you know, it's, it's a parallel passage of what we're looking at here. And it's not really about hating family. Uh, you know, in their day and in their culture, that was a way of really emphasizing how much more you love another person. Like, you got to love Jesus so much that it looks like you hate your family compared to him. That's basically what he's saying. Y'all understand that? I, I hope you get that, because that's really, it's not about hating family. It's about loving Jesus so much more than your family that it's really noticeable, you know? And, and, and one of the dangers, and I, I think this is one of the most serious dangers that I've seen in churches over, over my years of life, of good Christian parents a lot of times, is that of elevating a love for a child above their love and dedication to God. It's a dangerous place to find yourself. You know, and I can see how it'd be easy to do that. You know, be careful not to put your children before the Lord. The Lord has called us to put Him first and everything else at a distant second, isn't it, really? I think about Abraham. Remember when God called Abraham, He called him out of the Ur of the Chaldees. And they say that's pretty much where modern-day Iraq is. And God called Abraham and He says, All right, Abraham, pack up your stuff. And I want you to go and go and go, and I'll tell you when you get to where you're going. That's basically what he told him, wasn't it? He said, go to a land that I'll show you. And so Abraham went west, didn't he? I guess that's, that's where God was prodding him. And, and God was leading him to the land of Canaan, so it would be a land for his people. And Abraham left because he left all of his family. He left his previous uh, or any ties he had to any faith systems there that didn't belong to our God and he left that he made a decision to leave all those people behind and go where God wanted him to go and not only that but you remember how God tested Abraham's love for Isaac don't you one of the most famous stories in the Bible probably where God told Abraham to take his only son Isaac and put him on an altar and to sacrifice him there. <laughs> That's crazy. It, I mean, it sounds crazy. 
But God knew what he was doing, and I always preach it like this. I believe Abraham believed that God had the power to resurrect the dead. And he already knew of the promise that God had that he would send a son who would die and be raised. Somehow, I think Abraham knew that. That's, that's the only way he could have done it, in my opinion, is he believed that of God. And he thought, you know, if I put this sword through my son, God's going to raise him from the dead. He's going to do something, and he trusted God. Why would he do that? Because he loved God more than he loved his son, didn't he? <laughs> I tell you, um, I remember a man approached Jesus in the New Testament, and, and he wanted to follow Jesus. You can read about it in Luke chapter 18, verses 28 through 30. He wanted to follow Jesus, and, um, but he said, At first, I want to go bury my father. And, and the construction of that basically tells us his father wasn't even dead. It wasn't like he died and he, you know, the funeral's tomorrow and I'll, I'll come next day. No, his father was still living. So basically he's telling Jesus, I, I love you and I want to follow you, but I want to stay with my father till he dies. And then I'll come and follow you. <laughs> and Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. Basically he's saying, let the spiritually dead bury the dead. And so he didn't want to follow Jesus more than anything, did he? He didn't love Jesus more than he loved his father. You must love God more than you love your family. Jesus must have preeminence in your life. And you know what it takes? It takes a conscious decision on your part to put Jesus number one in your life uh, and to love him more than any other person that you know. You have to decide to do that. Because if you don't make a conscious decision and say, you know what, you deserve my love and I'm going to love you more, then, then you're going to go down a slippery slope where you're going to constantly put your wife or your children or your parents or somebody else that you care about in front of Jesus. And that's not what he's called us to, has it? You've got to make that decision. It, it demands a decision. Following Jesus demands a decision. Is he going to be first? Are you going to follow him as long as you're not doing something else? Are you going to follow him as long as it don't interfere with your job? As long as it don't interfere with, with um, you know, your fun? Are you going to follow him on Sundays? Maybe a Sunday every now and then? Are you going to follow him all day, every day like he deserves? That's what he's called us to, isn't it? You've got to decide. And a lot of people decide, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow Jesus on Sunday. I'll go to church. And that's pretty much it, because, you know, I'm good. He's called us to more than that. I know it's a difficult word for some. I'll tell you, it's a difficult word, but hey, it's the truth. It's the truth. President Reagan told a story about he had an aunt when he was a boy who took him to a cobbler for a new pair of shoes. He, he, he would be old today, wouldn't he? I don't know how. He'd be 100 probably. I don't know. But, but um, he was born pretty early. And the cobbler asked the young boy, because we don't go to cobblers for shoes anymore, do we? Some of y'all probably don't even know what that is. <laughs> but, but President Reagan went to this cobbler, and the cobbler asked him, says, do you want square-toed shoes or do you want round-toed shoes? And Reagan said, I, I just couldn't decide. And so uh, the cobbler says, well, I'll give you a few days. And several days, uh, the cobbler saw Reagan on the street. And, and he asked him again. He said, well, did you decide what kind of shoes you want? You want round-toed shoes or square-toed shoes? And, and Reagan said he still couldn't make up his mind. So the, the, the cobbler says, all right, young and says, come by in a couple of days, and I'll have your shoes ready for you. And so he said when he went to pick up his shoes, he found that he had one square-toed shoe and one round-toed shoe. <laughs> Not a pair like them anywhere else, I guess, you know. But, uh, but uh, the, the cobbler says, this will this will teach you to never let people make decisions for you. And um, Reagan said, I learned right then and there, if you don't make your own decision, someone else will. Well, I want to tell you, if you don't make the decision to follow Jesus and put him number one, then you've made a decision. You've made a decision not to make him number one. You're number one. And that don't wind up 
the way God wants it for you. And you'll find out it don't wind up like you want it for you either. You must put Jesus number one. Following Jesus involves a decision. You've got to decide to love him first and foremost. Matthew 22, verses 35 through 38, talks about a young lawyer who came to Jesus, and he said, he asked him, says, what's the greatest commandment? He's trying to trip Jesus up, I guess, or maybe he's sincere, but, but he said, Jesus responded, he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the in Mark, I believe it adds, and all your strength. So you must make a decision when you follow Jesus to love him more than anything else. Following Jesus brings the vision, and following Jesus demands a decision. Is he going to be first? Are you going to put him first? Another consequence of following Jesus is this, is it requires dedication. It requires dedication. We're going to look at verses 38 and 39 here. In verse 38, he says this. He says, And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. <laughs> and so this is what happens when you put Jesus first. That means you're willing to die for him, right? Why would you be willing to die for him? Because greater love has no man than this, right? That he'd lay down his life for his friends. And if you love Jesus, you, you, you're willing to lay down your life for him. You've got to be willing to take up your cross. That means you're going to be crucified. You know that, right? When you take up your cross, it don't mean that you, uh, you know, don't get to go to the ball game Sunday afternoon because you have to go to church. <laughs> no. If that's the way you feel, you ought to just go to the ball game. I tell you the truth. That's not that's not what he's talking. He's talking about laying down your life for Jesus. And he says, if you're not willing to do that, you're not worthy of me. Why? Because he laid down his life for you. That's why. That's why. And that's what he's called us to. Remember what Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and and in, I mean, not the church of Corinth, in the, the churches of Galatia. In Galatians 2.20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He's already being crucified. You are crucified. When you give your heart and life to Jesus, the old you dies. So live like the old you is dead and let the new you live. Amen? <laughs> oh, man, that's right. It's not really just figurative and spiritual. It is spiritual, but it's an attitude that you must embrace in reality. And notice how Christ continues in verse 39. He says, he who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. You see what he's saying here? Is if you decide to keep your life and live your life the, your, the way you want, then you lose your life. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, my goodness. He says, if you... Give your life for him, you'll find life in Christ. That's the difference. It, it takes dedication. Following Christ takes dedication. It's, it's giving up your life to let him live through you. And when you give up your life, you'll find that he is living through you. That's what Galatians 2.20 is talking about. Your life's not even yours anymore. It's Christ living in you. Living through you. Oh man, you've got to... Be willing to do that. It requires dedication. A dedic you got to be dedicated to not live in your own life. To let Christ live through you. I know it's a hard concept, to, but that's what he's called us to, isn't it? Amen, preacher. That's right. That's what he's called us to. Thank you all for that. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know. This is a hard word. It is a hard word. But I want to remind you what Christ has for us and who he wants us to be. We must be dedicated to him. 
In the book One Crowded Hour, Tim Bowden uh, describes an incident that happened in Borneo in 1964. Nepalese fighters were known as Gurkhas, and they were asked if they would be willing. This is what they asked them. They asked these, these fighters, these combat Nepalese fighters, if they would jump from airplanes into combat with the Indonesians. And there were some language barriers and things, so it was really hard to communicate to them exactly what they were asking them to do. But the, but the Gurkhas, you know, they bravely said, oh, yeah, it says, if you'll fire slowly over a swampy area and under about 100 feet, we'll, we'll do it. That's what they told them. And then when they were told that, that the parachutes wouldn't have time to open from under 100 feet, they replied, oh, you didn't mention the parachutes. <laughs> That's right. That's what you call dedication, right? <laughs> they were willing to jump without parachutes to defend the people they love and to fulfill their mission. And folks, that's what you need to be when you're a follower of Jesus. you got to be willing to jump without a parachute if God asks you to jump without a parachute. That's right. you got to be willing to do that. you got, you got to put on the bravery of Christ, the courage of Christ. Uh, you know, a believer is to put to death all his desires and instead fulfill the desires of Christ. And that's a daily, daily thing. And if you don't have your time with Christ and you don't grow close to Christ, you will never, ever, Never ever even understand what this means. None of us will. Christ demands our lives. And if you're going to follow him, you've got to give up everything, even your very life itself. And so it's really simple. The man who's willing to lose all that he has, all that this life has to offer, and to put Jesus first in everything, he'll have everlasting life. There will be a day of resurrection, right, for you. And, but if you reject Christ and turn away from him to escape physical death, even though he, he, you, know, you might continue physical life, you lose. I'm not saying you lose eternal life. There's, you, you, there's no indication that you have eternal life. Before the text we read today, these two verses proceeded in, Jesus said, therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him will I also confess before my Father who's in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father is in heaven. And he said, I came to bring a sword. And so he's saying, look, I want you to stand up and confess me. And somebody might, might decide to take your life because of that. That's kind of what he's getting at. And he says, and if you confess me, I'll confess you. That's where we want to be, isn't it? We want to be brave enough to confess Jesus, even if it costs us our life. That's where we need to be with Jesus. We need to love him that much, and we need to trust him that much. You must follow Jesus and not be ashamed. Your whole life is his, if you're one of his. And as believers... We must love Christ more than our own lives. And, and if we deny him to save our own physical lives, how can we say we love him? You know? How can we even say we believe in him? Believers must stand strong in persecution and faithfully proclaim Christ as Lord, even if it costs them their lives. Now, most of us in America, we've not ever experienced this. People in, in Muslim countries around the world, in Africa, in the Middle East, and and in Asia, they know about this every day. And they're giving their lives every day for the cause of Christ. But a lot of times, people in America, they won't leave their air-conditioned or heated homes to go sit on padded pews in air-conditioned and, 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 and air buildings to worship with people who love Jesus and who's going to encourage them to live for Jesus. But in these other countries, a lot of them are going in darkness, to, in underground tunnels to worship Jesus so they won't be killed on their way to or from. 
Yeah. We can learn a lot from them, I think. You may find yourself at a crossroads this morning. The question for you is this. It's really simple. You're at a crossroads. Which way are you going to go? Are you going to go your way? Or are you going to go with Jesus? Are you going to follow Jesus? Or are you going to do what you want to do? That's the question. And to follow him is the right choice. It may bring division. It demands a decision to put him first. And it requires dedication. You'd be willing to even give up your own life for him. So I, I, we're all standing there this morning. Some of us have never taken one of those routes before. Some of us have constantly went our own way. Some of us are trying our best to stay on that way that follows Jesus. So maybe today you need to make a decision. If you want to step out in faith this morning and trust Jesus for the first time, you, you recognize you're a sinner, then you just cry out to Jesus and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I've been, I'm on the wrong way. I need you to come into my heart my life. I need you to change me and help me to follow you. Will you do that this morning? You know what the Bible says Jesus will do if you ask him that? He says, I will come in. He says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, I will will hear. He says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And he says, if if he's knocking on a door and you let him in, he says, I will come in to him. Now's the time to do that. Will you do that this morning? Let's do that. Let's be faithful to the Lord. Let's follow Jesus. Let's bow our heads and let's respond in faith this morning. Lord, thank you for your word today. God, we understand how much you've loved us and you've showed us your great love for us and now you've called us to follow you and to love you back with the same kind of love. God, help us to do that. Right now, God, we pray that you'd touch those hearts that need you today. Draw them to your salvation. Lord, for all of us who know you, God, help us to be faithful and full of courage to live out the faith you've called us to. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Let's respond in faith this morning. If you